This is High School Not So Much a Musical, a podcast that takes you on a ride through the peaks and valleys of a high school journey. Here are your presenters, Nitin Jaladanki and Ayush Agarwal. Hello everybody and welcome back to High School Not So Much a Musical. Today we are joined with Victoria Wilson Crane, who is a grief counselor who specializes in helping people with the deaths of their close one and trauma. So Victoria, if you could give uh, the the listeners a quick introduction about yourself, that'd be great. Sure, thank you for having me. It's really nice to be here. Um, yeah, so just to introduce a bit about myself then, um, I'm actually something that's called a Certified Grief Recovery Specialist. Um, I'm not a counsellor, I'm somebody that helps people through a process which is designed by the um, Grief Recovery Institute called uh, the Grief Recovery Method. And what we do is we take people through this academic program to help them um, be able to face experiences of grief that they may have had in their lives and hopefully aim to make them feel better as a result. I'm actually um, an academic. Um, I work in higher education in the United Kingdom. And this work is a little bit of a sideline really, which I came across after the experience of a couple of quite significant bereavements myself in the last couple of years. And I was really struggling to be able to process that grief and to be able to move on from that grief. So I found it really useful to um, find the grief recovery method and go through it myself. And a result of that, I really want to share it with people. So that's why I'm here today. Okay, thank you so much for that. And obviously there's like so much out there relating to like grief counselors or grief specialists in general. And like what inspired you to become one? Because it's such like a niche market and not many people have the expertise to join or like the motivation to learn about it. And actually you probably have to get some certifications, take a course and stuff like that. So what was like that, even though many people experience death, but what, what was it for you that really pushed you to wanting to help others also overcome it? Yeah, it's a really good question because it, it's not an easy thing to talk about. And that's part of the problem. Although we all face deaths, um, it's an inescapable experience. We're all gonna have situations when people die in our lives. Um, we don't talk about it in our society very well. And that was one of the challenges really when I faced um, a bereavement. My young niece died, she was only 22, and she died very suddenly in January uh, 2020. And it really took us all as a family by surprise, as you can imagine, a very um, otherwise fit and healthy uh, young person. And I found that I was both trying to find ways to um, process my own grief as well as help those in my wider family. So that's the reason why I was really motivated to do the course because I didn't really find anything else out there. Um, I read a lot of books, being um, somebody who reads and writes for a living, I read a lot of books and tried to understand what other people had said about grief, but none of it really spoke to me. Um, And particularly none of it spoke to me because although I was very, very close to my niece, there were plenty of other people in her life that were closer to her than that. She had two sets of parents, uh, two brothers, Um, a boyfriend, grandparents, and I felt like I was even on the outside of that trying to support those who were closer to to, um, to her than than I was. So knowing that people need help and knowing that those people need support in some way, um, I think that was my main motivation really to to seek out something. Um, I alluded in the introduction that I'd also had um, other bereavements. My cousin also passed away um, the same year, um, very, very shortly after my niece. And um, again, I had this sense that it was quite difficult to begin to grieve for him because we still had a lot to deal with, um, with grieving for my niece. And I've learned through the process that actually grief is quite cumulative. So unless you deal with Um, episodes of grief or times when you've had losses in your life, unless you deal with those and you try to better understand, you can find that those experiences can kind of build up and and then we might get to a stage where we're kind of more in crisis rather than being able to cope with with normal daily life. So I recognise that a little bit in myself and I recognised it in other people because You mentioned that lots of people are are facing grief, particularly the last couple of years. 
Many people, I'm sure, sure in your audience will have lost either family members or friends, um, either through just normal experiences or perhaps through the pandemic. The grief recovery approach as well doesn't only look at losses through bereavement. That was my main focus, certainly when I found the method, but actually many of us just experience losses through other things. So if we think about grief as our reaction to changes to normal patterns of behaviour, which is one of the definitions that we use, um, maybe changing schools or changing location where you're living, changing friendship groups, um, even deciding to move on from something. So a good example is if somebody decides to leave a job that they're very happy with um, to go on to a better job. Uh, maybe they're going to be paid more money for that. Maybe they're going to get a um, you know higher prestige or uh, more recognition for that role. Um, there's still a potential for an element of grief in that too. So I think it's important to recognise that Grievers, we're probably all grievers to some degree. Um, many of us may be grieving because of quite significant bereavement, as in my case, but others of us have had grief because we've had other losses. Other losses could include uh, pet bereavement. So if we've had pets, and I know we've we've had animals in our family, certainly, and it's it's very distressing and disturbing when when they do pass away, or even when they when they're lost. Um, we could experience grief in that situation as well. So there are many different ways that we can be grieving, not just around bereavement. So as I started to learn a bit more about this, it made me think, I think we could talk about this in a better way. Um, and certainly to our young people, I think it will be really important to, um, to start to educate our younger generation so that we do have a dialogue around this and we know the words to use around death and dying because they can be quite scary words and they're words that people avoid using. Yeah, um, thank you so much for that. And like, you know, you mentioned a lot how like there's so many different scenarios that one person or situations that like a person could go through where they could experience grief. Like obviously like you could lose a loved one or like if you're just pet is lost, like like they ran away from your home or something, or you know, if they did like do end up dying because like, or I have a, I have a dog myself. So like, I try not to like think about that day when I'll come or when we have to like put her down. But, um, like one of the questions I have for you is that like, you know, you you keep mentioning grief, but I feel like the listeners, like maybe they would want to know, like, what would you define grief as? Like, is it similar to depression or are they sort of like the same thing with a couple of differences or are they like com completely different? That's a really, really good question because grief is so unique. Um, it's hard to characterize it. And that's why it's possibly hard to recognize when people are grieving because you may be thinking that people are characteristically um, uncontrollably crying or they're depressed all of the time. And actually in my experience, both of my own grief and talking to other grievers, it looks nothing like that. It looks like that some of the times, but I think grief can be very subject to change. So it can be difficult following the very initial um, shock or the initial um, bereavement or initial loss that has taken place. When you get a couple of weeks and, and months on, it, it's really hard to identify whether somebody is grieving or not. Some of those characteristics can show. So you might be able to notice that if you've got friends or, or family members who um, are struggling to engage with normal things and not finding joy in, in normal things, that is a sign of, of, of depression. And that could be as a result of, uh, as a result of grief. You don't have to be always miserable though to be grieving. Um, when we're grieving, it's sometimes a case where things will just come over us and it could be a reminder of something. So if we either see something or hear something or somebody says something that gives the reminder and it brings up um, some of the painful memories, that's what grief can also, also look like. So it's, it's something that's very, very difficult to characterise, but I think following a definition of it's the normal and natural reaction to loss but actually many of the things that our society teaches us show us that the way we ought to be behaving is not normal and not natural so our society encourages us to do things like replace the loss so if it's a pet for example um, and if something happens to your dog fairly soon 
I would expect that somebody might suggest that you could get another dog. And that seems pretty natural and it seems sensible, but it's never going to replace the dog that you have now. The, the dog that comes into your life afterwards will be different, uh, will be fantastic, but will not be a replacement for the dog that you have now. And then if society teaches us that, so if that does happen to you and then suddenly a person disappears from your life, either through bereavement or through estrangement, so a relationship breaks down, for example, how do you apply that tool that you've been taught, which is replace the loss? That's actually quite difficult to do if it's a person and if they've died, because you're never going to be able to replace that loss. So that's just one example of how grief um, in society, we are given a number of messages which are really not very helpful to us to help us get through grief. And what we also try to do, and that's an example of that with the um, with replace the loss, is it's, it's about giving it an intellectual statement. So something logical that you could do if something happens to your dog is to get another dog, when actually grief is about what we feel in our heart and about our hearts being broken. So actually finding a logical answer to that is not gonna heal what is happening in your heart. Yeah, on that note of like, like replacement, um, like the thing I've noticed is that a lot of people, like when they do lose like their first dog or anything, they won't, they won't get like, sometimes they won't even get another dog mm -hmm. because they're like, it took such a, it had such, it took such a big toll on their life, like losing like an animal they had or a pet they had for like 15 years. And like, they're like, oh, I just wanted to stay in my mind and be part of my like memories. So I'm, I'm not going to replace it, I'll just think of it. But um, uh, like moving on, uh, previously you mentioned like, like you have a book that was recently published and uh, uh, for the listeners listening, it's called 16 Days and we'll go ahead and put a link to it, uh, the Amazon link to it in the description. But uh, it was about like your niece that passed away and it was a very sudden and unexpected death. And the 16 days were, was when uh, like the, from the day she passed to the day of the funeral. So like, I know during those, uh, during those 16 days, you were going through a lot of like mixed emotions, but could you talk about like sort of what the process is from when someone passes um, to like, to the funeral day? Yeah, certainly a really um, interesting one because I think again, because we don't talk about this, we don't really know what to expect when that's gonna happen. So a couple of things probably to, to help your listeners understand. Um, my niece died in hospital and it was her choice to donate her organs. So actually from the time that she died, um, it was a couple of days before actually all the machines that were supporting her body to be remaining alive were switched off because organ donation involves a tremendous amount of coordination because all the different parts that could be used by, by somebody else, um, the organ donation team need to coordinate with them they will have lists of people that could possibly be recipients of those organs and they have to try and work out, okay, the timing, um, the suitability, the match, that kind of thing. So there was quite a lot of activity that as a family, obviously we weren't involved in, but it meant that moving forward to be able to start things like planning a funeral, um, were actually a little bit on hold until we got to that stage. So there was a couple of days of doing that and actually the time was spent by um, by me around that time. A lot of that was coordinating communication with, with our family and friends. We don't have a large family. Um, we've got quite a, a sort of wide circle of friends and I felt it was quite important to try and tell people in person if we could because this was just shocking news that uh, whilst it would have been quick and easy for me to tell people on the phone, um, actually for the person receiving that news, that's really hard to hear on the phone. So um, I did a lot of visits to, to people and um, visited different, different places of work, for example, to, to explain what had happened, just so that everybody understood the, the, the situation that we were in. Um, I think beyond that, then there's a meeting with um, a funeral director. And again, I'm, I'm not sure whether your listeners in the US, whether there's any differences or similarities here, but this is definitely what happens in the UK. There's a meeting with uh, the funeral director who really helps with all the coordination and they will um, prepare the deceased body. So they will prepare the body for um, either burial or cremation, whichever the, the, either the person has expressed before that they would like or the family's wishes beyond that. 
And then really it's like organising quite a big um, public event and particularly when you've got somebody who you're expecting quite a number of people might want to be part of a funeral to to say goodbye. Um, so it's the organisation of finding a location for that, whether it's going to be um, at a crematorium or at a church or at both. Um, it could be a non-denominational, it could be something um, for somebody who doesn't have any religious beliefs, so there could be a non-denominational funeral, which could be simply um, an event at a graveside. Um, so lots and lots of different choices to make. And whilst it feels a little bit morbid, um, we were very, very lucky that um, our niece had actually discussed with, with her family some of her wishes of what might what she might like when she died, although none of us knew this was going to happen so quickly. But we think that had happened because she herself had experienced a, a bereavement of a, a friend a couple of years before, so she'd kind of been through the process a little bit herself. Um, we weren't able to act on one of her wishes, which was she would have preferred a small private funeral, but that's quite difficult to do when you're from a small town and lots of people know each other. So what we ended up doing was having um, a small, relatively small service at a crematorium. And then beyond that, we went on to a memorial service at a much larger church. And that was the church that she'd used as part of her school um, experiences. We're not particularly religious as a family, but we are Church of England, we are Christian. So that was where we had the, had the service. So there's a lot of decisions to be made. Um, and you, your hand is held a little bit through that by these people called funeral directors who will help and take over. Some religions um, are quite keen in a Christian setting, in a Church of England setting, um, to allow families to see the body once it's been prepared for, for burial um, or cremation. And that was something that I talk about in the book because I'd never before seen a dead body. Um, I had seen bodies when people had immediately died because I'd previously worked as a care assistant in a nursing home with, with elderly uh, people. And I had been there at, at a time when one of my aunties died, but I hadn't seen a body in a funeral director sort of prepared for, for, for death. But it wasn't scary because it was just her. Um, and it was actually quite a relief to, to, to go and see her. So again, um, this this can all be quite different depending on your cultural background. I know that different religions um, have expectations of how soon the, the, the um, deceased body will be buried. So I'm just talking purely from our experience um, that we had with, with my niece. But yeah, a lot of decisions to be made. Um, it's quite a busy time and I think that's perhaps something that you don't understand when you haven't been through it. Um, it was quite relentless. The, those days went by very, very quickly. You might be picturing that people are sitting at home crying, um, people are sitting at home just talking, drinking tea, um, but actually there's an awful lot to do. And I think when you do get to the stage of the funeral, um, beyond that, that's often when the supporters continue to get on with their own lives and, and move on a little bit. And the most immediate family is left a little bit um, sometimes a little bit alone because the funeral is really more of a kind of public event to help people say their farewells, say their goodbyes and also speak to the family and support the family in my view. But actually it's after the funeral that some more of that support really needs, needs to take place. So I think between the, between the death and the funeral it's just a very very busy time, there's a lot to do, um, a lot of um, what one of the authors that I, I read when I was um, preparing for, for writing my book, there's, um, there's a guy in, in the UK, Reverend Richard Coles, who's written a book and he calls it Sadmin, um, all the administration that you need to do um, around somebody's death. And I think that's quite a good term to use. Okay, yeah. Um, like, so, you know, that's great to hear. And I mean, it's like it's, it's actually kind of like refreshing to hear at the end how you know when you eventually did see your niece um you were kind of like happy to see her because like in the end it was just her and like i know high schoolers especially nowadays they could be going through it a lot like i'm not saying like a lot of them are experiencing deaths like some of them may be experiencing deaths from covid nowadays but like a lot of them you know they might be going through depression um sometimes you know some may be going through grief 
Uh, but I wanted to know, like, like now, like we talked about sort of why you um, wanted to become a grief specialist. Uh, so now I wanted to know, like, what do you do like nowadays or like how have you worked with any people recently? And like, you don't, you know, you obviously don't have to disclose their information or anything, but can you talk about like sort of like the background between like how you like help these people or just some generic examples of the people you've helped? Yeah, of course. Um... As grief is such a unique experience, all of the clients that I've had so far have all brought quite different situations to, to discuss. Um, and actually, the, just to be clear about the, the grief recovery method, um, although I say we, we talk about stuff, it, it's, it's not a talking therapy, so it's not counselling as such. Counselling has got its place, definitely, but it's more of a kind of um, action process where you go through a number of quite deliberate steps to hopefully make yourself feel better um, when you're feeling, uh, when, when you're grieving. So the clients that have come to me, I've had a couple of interesting experiences lately. Um, one client who came to me because their relative was in a nursing home and they actually built up a very strong uh, bond with that establishment when their relative was unwell and, and before they died in, in the nursing home. And it was actually the nursing home that they were grieving for because they'd spent such a long time there, they'd invested such a, a lot of effort into the nursing home. And it was something that was part of their grief from losing their loved one that they were really struggling to, to, um, to understand. And again, if we go back to that definition about grief being um, our reaction to something changing, if you do have a relative who's elderly and, and they're being cared for in a in a home, in an establishment, um, when they die, you 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 lose them as a person, and you lose everything around around their, their life, and you, you've you've got your fond memories, of course, hopefully, but you've also lost that structure, that um, pattern of behaviour that you had, those relationships that you might have built up with the carers who spent such a long time taking very good care of your loved one. So even if it's been um, as positive as those experiences could possibly be, there's also going to be an element of loss around an establishment. And I was learning about this when I was, because um, I feel like I'm continuing my training as a, as a specialist. I do have the, the credential, I do have the certificate, as you say now, but every single client is so different. So I was talking about that scenario with my support group, because I have a, have a peer group of grief specialists and we can talk about how we're helping advise other people. And um, it was explained to me that this can be quite common to feel a sense of grief when you, either choose to leave or for whatever reason you do not have that relationship with um, an external agency that you used to have. So another way that was described to me was, um, I've mentioned church already, if people choose to leave and move on from a church community or another religious community, which is sometimes all consuming and a big part of people's lives, there can be a sense of grief um, where that is, that is involved as well. So I really hadn't expected that because as I say, the reason I came to um, to have this training was because of my own experiences and I expected it to be all about death, but it's actually much, much wider than that. Um, another of my clients has been talking about a relationship with one of their siblings that to their mind has not been as positive as it, as it could have been. And they were thinking that was blocking them a little bit from building relationships elsewhere in their lives. So I've been working quite closely with them to think about that relationship and how they can they can make that better. The one great benefit of that is that there could be some action that that client can take with that living relative because they are still around, which may then mean their life is even more enriched as they go further forward. I think another example, and it's, it's not been a client that I've had so far, but it's definitely one we've discussed as part of um, learning about grief recovery method is something called the loss of hopes and dreams. So if people expected to do something in their lives and it didn't happen, either because of a choice they made or maybe things just did not fall into place, there can be a sense of grief and loss for things that, that didn't yet happen. So for your listeners, if you have aspirations maybe to follow a particular career, but maybe your academics are not quite up to scratch, or maybe that option is just not there for you because other people have plans for you. Um, there could be a sense of grief around that too, because 
there's something that you expect to do with your life that you're not going to get to do and we're all going to face elements of that hopefully opportunities will be there for us but things sometimes get in the way so if that does happen recognize that it could be grief that you're experiencing and if it's grief that you're experiencing try to find help with grief rather than thinking oh there's something wrong with me i'm i'm not normal um i'm a failure i'm i'm not able to do that it's all my fault it could just be the grief that that's that's affecting you so i'm really enjoying working with clients at the moment i didn't expect to be doing that i did the training in the hope that it would help me um but i'm just having some really interesting experiences and i think it's also just helping me start to talk about death and dying in very very different ways that i hope might help other people um as i've been talking to you here today i'm trying not to choose my words too carefully because i think one of the challenges we have with death and dying is we use a lot of euphemisms around it and we use a lot of words that are avoiding the actual words themselves which can confuse people and i think they can particularly confuse young people and children so if we say to a, a, a young person, um, you know, we've, we've lost your granddad, um, does that mean he got lost in the supermarket? Does that mean he went to a different country and got lost and he didn't have a map and he couldn't find his way around? Because children know what the word lost means. We've taught them that it means to um, perhaps lose a toy or to lose a shoe or something like that. So to try and use that word when we're describing death and dying can actually be quite confusing. So I'm, I'm just um, enjoying, if that's the right word, but just enjoying the learning process of developing a whole new um, set of vocabulary around death and dying, which I hope will help me help others and maybe help myself as well, because the inevitable will happen again at some point in my life. Um, and I hope I'm not quite so lost as I felt when, um, when I experienced the death of my niece in um, January 2020. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing, Dr. Wilson Crane. And um, I think that I want to kind of get more into the definition that you're talking about of death and dying and all this kind of like, the kind of language that goes around death, because there's so much that people just don't understand. I feel like there's just words that people jump to. So I just want to save that for part two. And thank you so much for listeners for listening to part one and make sure they tune into part two. And thank you so much, Dr. Wilson Crane, for your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. That's our show for today. Now roll the credits. High School Not So Much a Musical is hosted by Ayush Agarwal, Nitin Jaladanki, and Rishi Sinha. Narration by Samhit Padala. Music from Louis Luang Relaxation Cafe, Tune Pocket, and Infraction. If you like the show, please recommend it to your friends and family. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>